As we know, and as up in the screen behind us, we're going to look at this subject over the course of our special effort, the subject of the judgment seat. We just want to start off by emphasising the judgment seat is probably the only certainty we actually have, the absolute certainty we have, those of us responsible, of course, for baptism, uh, for, uh, for, for judgment, rather. There's an old saying that goes, uh, the only certainties we have in life are death and taxes. Well, for many of us, death may not be a certainty. If the Lord returns, death is not necessarily a certainty. But nonetheless, the only certainty we really have is the judgment seat of Christ. And scripture emphasises the, the, the definiteness of that, of that reality, I suppose, and uses language like, we must appear before the judgment seat of Christ. We'll come back and look at these verses uh, a bit more slowly later on in the week, but for now I just want to pick up some, some uh, ideas and concepts from them. We must appear before the judgment seat of Christ. It is appointed for men to die once, but after this the judgment. You get the, the definiteness that's built into those words. So it is an absolute reality and a certainty for, for all of us. In our first session this afternoon, it's more of an overview session, so we're not going to, to, to get right down into nitty gritty so much. We'll do that later on uh, during the week as things progress. But we want to look at the, I suppose, the, the context of the subject and the, and the big picture involving the subject of the judgment seat and identify some of the issues that we want to really uh, flesh out as the week progresses. You know, when I or anyone mentions the word judgment seat, what is the, the first emotion that, that floods your mind when you first hear that term, judgment seat of Christ? Is it one of dread? Is it one of terror? Is it one of fear? And if it is, is that right? Is that correct to have a sense of fear or, ju or, or, um, or terror about the judgment seat? And we want to just explore that and look at that um, and identify problems that may arise because of that reaction. For example, we've got a problem here. If, if the judgment seat fills us with dread when we really contemplate it or we think about it, we think about the process and we think we're going to be examined minutely in a forensic type of um, interrogation. And on the basis of that process, a, a judgment will be made about our eternal salvation. That, that in itself surely is a, is a very frightening thing. And if we're terrified of that or fearful of that, and yet in our public statements we say we are longing for the Lord's return, and we say that all the time. It's a long four day. We want Christ to return. All our public prayers and our, uh, our chairman say it quite rightly and we, we express it to our children, etc. So we're saying we want Christ to return, but we're also terrified of the judgment. There's a, there's a disconnect there, isn't there, to some degree. And so we just want to explore that. Say, so why, why are we terrified of the judgment? See, and yet at the same time we're saying we want, we want Christ to, to return. There are other issues as well that that uh, are impinged by our, our understanding of the judgment seat. For example, we might be at the graveside of a, of a loved one and we know that there is comfort. Scripture gives us words of comfort regarding the destiny of that loved one. So we've got words like 1 Thessalonians 4. Um, Paul says, I would not have you ignorant, brethren, concerning them that are asleep, that you sorrow not as others that have no hope. So there's, there's an emotional effect that we have because of our hope because of our hope concerning our brother or our sister, our loved one that's there in the grave. And he then gives us the, the, the whole the process of, of the return of Christ, the, um, the gathering away of, the, of those that are alive, etc., and the resurrection of the dead. And then he says, wherefore comfort one another with these words. So there's, there's comfort, there is, there's emotional power. Don't sorrow as others do. And yet... If we're consistent with our view of the judgment seat, if we're terrified of the judgment seat for ourselves and we superimpose that on others, how can we really be at the graveside of a loved one and go, their next waking moment is going to be a forensic process of interrogation, going through their life, their inner motives, their inner thoughts, their um, motivations, all these things are going to be totally delved into and a decision made as to whether they're going to be accepted or rejected. 
are you really comforted if that's the picture you have and that's the reality you have of the judgment? Is it a genuine comfort there? Um, and, and these are things we just want to want to think about. Um, I, I, I'm just going to confess a few things about my own my own view, I suppose, of, of the return of Christ and the judgment seat. And I've just made this little example up, which I've called the back porch test, because there's been a few times in my life I've been a, I've been woken up at night, maybe two o'clock in the morning, two a.m., and I've been woken up by a noise on our back. Uh, back porch area and I could hear this noise at the door and in my mind I've woken up and I thought this is the angel, the angel's here right now and then it's turned out not to be the angels, Johnny coming home late or something like that or the dog but it, it was not the angel of course and I've examined my feelings after that event when, when this heightened sensation of thinking this is the angel then the realisation dawning on me that it's not the angel and then a, then a sort of a, a relief that comes over me. And I thought, why, why is there a relief? That, that, that can't be right. That, that is, there's a disconnect between my, what I'm telling everyone publicly and then my inner feelings. I'm, I'm, I'm resisting the, the, the return of Christ to, to, at an emotional level. What's going on there? And I've just called this a back porch test. I don't know if it's ever happened to you, but... I've talked to a few people who've said they've experienced similar feelings. And I don't think I'm alone in that. And I think in our brotherhood there is a reticence for the return of Christ or, or some sort of fear associated with it because of our, our view of the judgment seat and what's actually happening at the judgment seat. And that's what we want, to, we want to explore together over the course of this week. What is the purpose of the judgment seat um, and should it be something we're, we're terrified of? As I said, I think it's something in our, something in our community. I don't, I don't think it's just unique in my own ecclesia or in my own family. I think it's something that is there in our community generally, which we need to think about. Here's a, a letter I found in the Christadelphia magazine back in 2001. Um, just trying to work out whether I read from the screen or read from that. I might try from there if that's OK. Um, the writer says, I don't know any of the people mentioned in this letter, but it's a letter to the editor, Dear Brother Michael. Um, he references Brother Chris's letter on, in the May issue. It's most timely. He said, some years ago I sat at the bedside of a well-known, very experienced brother as he was dying. He was crying because he was terrified of the judgment seat. I tried to show him that having tried to walk not after the flesh but after the spirit, as a brother of Christ, he was uncondemned and had nothing to worry about. This brother had spent much time arguing about the atonement without apparently applying the first principles of it to himself. I suggest that possibly those who pray that we will be worthy also fall into this same category. As Brother Chris states, none of us will be found worthy, only accounted worthy. So that's just an, an, an article that appeared, or not an article, rather a letter in the Christophy magazine, expressing this experience that is in our brotherhood, even people who have been in the truth and actively involved in the truth all their life feeling this terror of the judgment seat. When I, I gave this at my own ecclesia, there's a, a brother at my ecclesia involved with the, the Christadelphian rest homes. And he came up to me afterwards and said, the staff at the rest homes have told him that out of all the residents in the, in the rest homes, the Christadelphians are the ones most terrified of dying. And, and they're terrified of dying because of the judgments, this, con this judgment seat that they're facing, that they know is, 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 is looming in their experience. Then I gave this study in Brisbane, and a sister came up to me after and said, I also work in the, in the rest home in Brisbane. She says, I can confirm that's exactly the experience that I come across as well. Now, that's anecdotal. They're just anecdotal um, observations. You might, have, you might have different experiences with your loved ones and relatives, and I'm not saying that's an absolute empirical piece of data, but it's interesting that there are many people in our brotherhood, people who have borne the heat of the day, who are now in rest homes, now in the twilight of their lives, and they are apprehensive and fearful, even terrified of the judgment seat. That can't be right. It doesn't reflect the attitude of the first century believers. It doesn't reflect quotes like 1 Thessalonians 4 at all. There's something, there's something wrong with that picture, I believe, and hopefully over the course of this week we want to, we want to explore that a little, a little bit more. 
In my discussions, I suppose, and, and in a lot of the statements I'm going to be making, I'm going to be focusing on a category of believers that I call normal. Throw up your hand if you think you're normal. I don't know. I'm, what do I mean by normal? Not many of us are normal. I did see a sign that said normal is a setting on your clothes dryer or something like that. So not many of us are normal. What I mean by normal, I'm talking about genuine brothers and sisters in Christ. If you're running a, a meth lab somewhere and involved in you know, crime, I, 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 can't, I don't know, I can't really speak for you, but I'm just talking about general brothers and sisters in Christ trying to raise our children, trying to be involved in, our, in the ecclesia. We fail, we sin, we are full of guilt for things that we've done. We, are, um, we know we haven't reached the, the potential that, 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 that could be reached if we used all our energy and all our, all our might to its full potential. We, we know that, we understand that. We know we've failed, we've got regrets about things we've done, regrets about things we haven't done. But we are, I'm just categorise us as, as, as normal believers. There's, there's exceptional believers, you know, Paul the Apostle, for example, incredible character who's just committed at a, at, a, at a level that I can't even comprehend. Okay, we, we put him in that, in that exceptional category. Um, you might even include... You know, Brother Roberts, for example, in, in a category like that, and you may have people in your own life who you would put in that exceptional category, and you can quite easily see how they would be accepted at the judgment seat. At the other end of the spectrum, we've got people who are faithless and wicked, people like Caiaphas, people like the, the scribes and the Pharisees who knew that Jesus was the son and still conspired to kill him, people at that end of the spectrum. I, I'm, and, and there's a lot of language directed at that end of the spectrum. You know, these terms like weeping and gnashing of teeth, etc. So we'll, we'll explore some of that in the context of those statements that we, we sometimes use. But I'm focusing on believers in Christ who, as I said, have all the problems of, of human nature and human experience and, and fail and sin without any doubt. But, but here is a list of things that, that categorise us normals uh, we believe in God's promises, don't we? We believe them. We believe they're true. We've been baptised into his son. We acknowledge God's ways are right. We don't live up to them all the time, of course, but we acknowledge the righteousness of God. Um, we live in hope and we believe in the kingdom as the only hope for, for mankind in this world. We, would, we want to do what's right in our life and doesn't necessarily mean we achieve that, but that, that's, that's in, our, in our heart. That's... that's the audience I'm directing our, our studies at over the course of, uh, of this week. And I think that categorises a lot of those people who are, who are terrified of, of the judgment seat. We just want to see if that is the feeling they should have and if that is the sentiment of, of the New Testament particularly and the sentiment of the early, the early believers. Um, the judgment seat as a doctrine is, is, in, is enshrined in our statement of faith and it's there in, uh, in, in sort of uh, doctrinal language there, quite, quite straightforward and quite clear. We're not going to deviate from, from any of the doctrinal reality of the judgment seat at all. Um, and those quotes that the, the BASF references, we'll be looking at them, God willing, during the course of our, of our week together to try and understand the subject. Um, and we'll come back to, to some of those definitions a bit later on. So we're not, we're not changing the judgment seat in any way, shape or form. It's there and we believe it um, absolutely. But what we're trying to investigate is the reason for it and, and the purpose of it in, in the overall plan and purpose of God and what that means for us personally. That, that's, that's really our objective, if that makes sense. There are some challenges when it comes to look at this subject. And in our first session now, our overview session, I'm going to just highlight some of these challenges. I'm not necessarily going to give any proofs or, um, or answers to some of these things so much. We'll get to those later, but I just want to put some of the challenges out there. One of the challenges we have in understanding this subject is there is no big slab of scripture about the judgment seat, a nice big concise treatise about the judgment seat, which would, which would be nice if there was, but there is not. Um, for example, you've got um, 1 Corinthians 15, the beautiful chapter on the resurrection. So it starts off talking about the, the reality of the resurrection and how, how essential it is to understand and believe in the resurrection, the uniqueness of the resurrection. 
and the power of the resurrection and then the process of the resurrection as the chapter goes on and the motivational power that comes from the resurrection, all, all there in this beautiful treatise that you've got and you can follow it through in a big, big slab of verses and, and reach the end of it and the crescendo and the, and the power of God seen through that and what it means for us that our, our labour is not in vain because we're associated with the resurrection. So it's, it's a beautiful big piece of scripture to get your teeth into. Baptism, we've got Romans 6, for example, the, the, the ramifications of baptism, the purpose of baptism, the ritual of baptism, the meaning of baptism, the implications there and the moral outcomes, all these things all sort of there in, in, a, in a big slab of verses in Romans 6 that you can follow through and follow the, 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 the line of thought through. Unfortunately, with the judgment set, we don't have a chapter like that. And this is one of the challenges we have. Um, there is no step-by-step -step process as much as we, we, you know, we, we might produce plays on the judgment seat or motivational uh, talks at youth conferences, etc. But we really do not have um, you know, an apostolic process laid out for us in, in, in really clear, straightforward language in, in the epistles, for example. What, what we do have with, is um, almost just little glimpses, little, little uh, I, I use this term, uh, advisedly like throwaway statements in the, in the New Testament where, where Paul might be talking about something totally different. He might be talking about you know, conscience and meat offered to idols and then he'll throw a little statement in about the judgment seat, just a little couple of lines and we can extract that. Or he might be talking about you know, being criticised in 1 Corinthians by others and he'll just make a little reference to the judgment seat in, in that context. So, so we don't have this a nice big slab of information, a big tree ties on it, we've just got to take a little bit from here, a little bit from there, these little statements that are scattered throughout the New Testament to put them together to try and get a picture of what's happening and more importantly really the, the purpose of what's happening and the reason behind it. There's not a lot written in the Brotherhood about the judgment seat. There is in, as far as the doctrine of the judgment seat goes, you've got Christendom astray and and, and a lot of other you know, key to understanding the Bible and all, all the first principle notes, etc. But there's not a lot written about the judgment seat as to what, what's, what, is, it, what is happening, why is it happening, what's the purpose of it, how, how it ties in with uh, our salvation, etc. So that, that's real, we don't really have much literature from that perspective. And so you might be tempted to go outside the Brotherhood and see if there are books outside the Brotherhood that might help you, but there's not much outside the Brotherhood either. Um, there are some obvious problems with going outside uh, the Brotherhood for information on this subject. One is, of course, uh, Christendom believes in heaven going. Well, if, you're, if, you're, if the soul, the immaterial soul, goes to heaven at death, there really is some sort of judgment happening at that time. And so different traditions have different ideas of the soul goes to heaven initially, but then at the end of times there's... The, the body and the soul are brought back together again and there's a great white throne judgment seat that happens in the future. It really makes no sense. It's sort of like, it, it's, it's, it does, it's not logical because it is based on a, a false premise, based on the, uh, the immortality of the soul and the possession of, uh, of, of this um, immaterial life. Also, most, uh, particularly evangelical books or books that you might get from non-Christadelphian sources are, are based on a, a theological framework called Calvinism. I don't want to go into that in any great detail, but most of the reformed churches have this idea of Calvinism built into their, into their belief system. It was actually goes back to Augustine back in the fourth century, but, but the reformers like uh, Luther and Calvin and Zwingli picked it up and, and, and adopted it, and it's become something that runs through uh, the evangelical church today. And it's got the idea that God has chosen certain people um, predetermined in his predetermined plan before the world began, picked certain people out, and he, he in, it's called determinism because he, he gets those people to salvation whether they want it or not. It's, this, it's, it's quite a bizarre concept, really. Um, it's re rejected by, by uh, you know, Brother Thomas and Brother Roberts, of course, is not uh, complying with the scriptural reality. And this is probably the biggest, I suppose, the biggest problem that going outside the Brotherhood on this subject has is they don't appreciate the plan and purpose of God and the whole concept of, of God manifestation and God developing us and working with us and uh, the whole process of bringing us to glory in that, in that, in that sense. So they're not going to have that, that perspective. So 
their, their views of the judgment seat are going to, be, going to be warped accordingly and not comprehensive. So I just make that observation up front because that, there's, there's not a lot in the Brotherhood, there's not a lot outside the Brotherhood, so we're really digging around as much as we can to try and find out what is involved in the judgment seat and what it's all about. And this is really the big challenge of our week together, is to, is to fit the judgment seat in with all our other doctrines. Because there, 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 are, there are issues with it. There are issues with, with grace and faith and, and, and all, all those metaphors of the atonement have been washed and covered and clothed and, 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 and you know, some of the statements we read in 1 John tonight. There's, there's things that appear to clash at a certain literal level with with the idea of a, of a judicial forensic process that determines an outcome uh, in the future. So, so we wanted, that, that's really one of our objectives, to try and tie in the judgment seat with the language of the atonement and the, and the metaphors of the atonement and, um, and, and the, our understanding of the atonement, what it means to be in Christ and what it means to be covered and, and, and declared righteous and imputed righteous, and all, all those concepts. We want to... We want to look at those and try and put them in, and put the judgment seat in, 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 a, in a way that makes sense of all that and is consistent and uh, not contradictory with that. Another question we're going to be asking as we go through, if our sins are forgiven, and there's a significant body of evidence in Scripture that our sins are forgiven now, I know, I know some people have a view that it's a future thing, but the, the, the Bible is really strong on that, and that's a whole subject for another day. But we, our sins are forgiven now. Um, if our sins are forgiven, why do we have a judgment seat? What, what's the purpose of it? And so I've, I've asked people, I, I get around the brotherhood a fair bit, and I've got relatives and friends all over, the, all over the place, so I've asked the question of different people as I've talked to them about the judgment seat. Why, why do we have a judgment seat at all if our sins are forgiven? Why, why is th that necessary? There are two theories that, that are the, the, two of the most popular theories, I suppose, that, that people respond with um, about the purpose of the judgment seat. These two theories, number one is it's for unforgiven sins. So sins that we haven't properly acknowledged and dealt with, they remain unforgiven and so the judgment seat will will deal with those. Now in a sense, I don't think that's wrong, but I don't think it's the overwhelming purpose of the judgment seat or the comprehensive answer to the subject, which hopefully we'll, we'll get to later on. Another, and this is probably more popular, I suppose, this view, I call it the proof of faith theory. Proof of faith, I can't even say that. Proof of faith theory says that of course we're saved by grace, it's a gift from God, eternal life's a gift. It's based on faith, but God needs to prove and see whether that faith is, is real. And so in examining our lives, God will arrive, there'll be, a, there'll be some sort of, we know we won't be perfect or, or um, sinless at all, but somewhere in, in, that, in our life there will be a decision made based on what we have done and what we haven't done. So uh, it will give evidence that our faith is actually real and actually exists and so prove our faith. Again, I don't think that's totally wrong, but I don't think it's comprehensive enough either. Let's look at the first theory, the, the, the unforgiven sins. Is there really such a thing? Is that, is, that, is that a thing that there are sins that are unforgiven? Or do we stand in a state of forgiveness? Are, you know, when the, when the Lord's Prayer, for, the Lord teaches us to pray and he says, forgive us our sins, is that only for sins that we actually have specifically identified and, and, and know? And all of us know that you know, we look back at our behaviour 10 years ago and, and we realise that certain things were sins that we didn't know then. And, and, and there's, there's a whole lot of um, issues about the, uh, the deceitfulness of our, of, our, of our nature and things like that that come, that come to play on this subject. So are there sins we, that aren't really forgiven and it won't be till the judgment seat when they're actually dealt with. And if that is the case, what about our public prayers at the meeting when we pray for God to forgive us our sins? Is that just a, just a, a sort of a, a platitude of sorts and it doesn't really carry any, any force or effectiveness? It's just something we say. Um, when Jesus says, when he heals, some, you know, heals someone and says, your sins are forgiven, that person still needs to specify each of those sins or else that is not actually effective. So 
So that unforgiven sins, I believe unforgiven sins or, or things that we don't acknowledge as sin will be dealt with at the judgment seat, don't get me wrong, but I don't think it's a comprehensive enough answer for what's happening at the judgment seat. This other idea that it's the proof of faith, I, I smell a tautology in this to some degree, a, a circular argument. We're saying we're saved by faith. It's, it's based on grace, which is a free gift. It's an unmerited gift from God, the gift of God's eternal life, for example. But then we say, however, for that gift to sort of kick in, there's got to be a level of, of achievement that has to happen before, before that applies. It, 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 there, there is this there is an issue. I mean, if I went to the ATO and said, um, I've got these people and I'm not going to actually pay them a wage, I'm just going to give them a gift every week of $1,000, but I'll check their work at the end of the week. If it's good enough, I'll give them $1,000. But it's just a gift. I don't want to take tax out or pay super or anything. The ATO would, would say, no, that doesn't, that's, 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 not a, that's not a gift at all. You're paying them a wage. You're checking their, you're, you're giving, checking their work and you're interviewing them and making sure they've, they've reach some sort of level and, and you're paying them some money. It's not a gift. You, there's, there's tax involved here. So, so I, I just don't know if that, that really, really uh, is, is, is a valid theory that says, well, we've got to prove our faith in a sense to see whether that faith reaches some sort of acceptable level. We'll talk more about this uh, as we go through the week as well. So is the judgment seat saying your bad works, you get demerit points, your good works, you get uh, you know, merit points and, and, and there's some sort of level that, that makes you acceptable or not. And there's also the whole subject of faith itself. You know, faith, faith is something that grows. Faith is something that we start our life in the truth with and it, and it develops as we go through. Um, Jesus talks about faith as like, like a mustard seed being the size of a mustard seed. He talks to his disciples in their immature stage and calls them, O ye of little faith. Um, and, and faith, you know, Romans talks about from faith to faith, you know, the development of faith in our life. So, so uh, the idea of believers reaching some faith level doesn't, doesn't really um, hold true as well. However, however, these ideas aren't wrong and, and, and they will formulate uh, some of the reasons for the, for the judgment seat and we'll get to those as we go through. This is probably one of, my, one of my biggest issues, I suppose, that we want, to, um, we, we want to get to as we go through this subject. The power of, of God and the, power of, the motivational power in our life from Scripture, overwhelmingly, the power, comes, the power is of what we might call a reciprocal power that generates a, 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 gener, generates a response. And it's all based upon the love of God. God's love for us is felt emotionally and it's appreciated and it generates a response. This is a scriptural concept, as we'll see, overwhelmingly grounded in scripture. And so our response is, is motivated by God's love to us. Now, if we live in this fear paradigm that says, some stage in the future, I'm going to be either resurrected or taken away and go through a, a, a judicial process where my inner man is opened up and um, all my motives and thoughts are read. And on the basis of that, it will be determined whether I will be saved or not. I, I doubt whether there's any motivational power in that paradigm, to be honest, for myself I'm, I'm talking. Because you, you have no idea that God loves you. You have no idea that you're a recipi recipient of God's grace or salvation until that actually happens sometime in the future. So the, the, the power that is generated from being saved and being um, a recipient of God's grace and being called and chosen and adopted and redeemed and all these, all these terms that are used in books like Ephesians, for example... Do, do they really apply to us at all? How, how do we know? There's no, there's no benchmark really given and we haven't got a real definite knowledge of whether we will achieve whatever it is. We know we won't achieve perfection at all, but is the bar lowered somewhat? And, and, and uh, if it is, where is it lowered? You know, we have no idea. So we could never really feel 
the emotional power of that reciprocated response. And these aren't just you know, feel-good statements I'm making. These are the very warp and woof of the, of the New Testament. This is, this is, this is what you know, the New Testament is all about, this reciprocation to the love of God. 1 John 4 talks about this idea. These are words we know very well. We love him because, you know, this Greek word, I think it's aro. Aro has got the idea of the, a logical conclusion. We, we love him because he loves us. And that love is real. We feel it in, in some way. There's, there's, a, there's a power to it. Um, and I said that, as I said, there's, there's many verses that, and I've just picked out a few here in our first session, and we might look at some others as we go through, but there are many verses that highlight this reciprocal aspect. Galatians 2 is a f very famous one. The life which I now live, and, and the context here is about Paul basically giving his entire life to God because he considers himself without the blessings of salvation as dead. And he goes, well, without, the, without this I was, I was dead. So I'm, I've got to give all my life to God. He says, the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me. Notice how he personalises that. God loves me. Um, well, the Son of God here loves me. We might shy away from that concept a little bit. Hey, how do you really know God? How do you know you're a recipient of God's love? You won't know that until you know, your behaviour all works out for the rest of your life or until Christ returns and at the judgment seat when you're examined, then you'll know whether you have earned the love of God or, or reached some sort of faith level that entitles you to the love of God. Paul's words are much more positive. He says, I, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me personally personalises himself in that and that is the motivational power we, we sometimes wonder what is, the, what is it that drives Paul what is it that makes Paul the incredible servant of God that he is it's because of words like this his reciprocating his response is being generated from what God has done for him he feels the reality of that now we know Paul sinned Romans 7 good that I would, I don't do, the things that I, I, I do, I don't want to do. He sinned, a wretched man that I am, he felt the power of sin, and yet he can speak with this, this sort of confidence. Uh, these are things we need to get a handle on. This is another famous statement from Paul, 2 Corinthians 5, the love of Christ constrains me, which is an interesting word that um, I think uh, ESV and other translations have compel. It's idea of motivation it's actually a word one the best the best description of that word was it's like um squeezing toothpaste you know you, you squeeze toothpaste and it, shoot, it shoots out of the tube that's the idea of this word it compels you it shoots you forth or i think strong's talks about it being like a a cattle crush where where cows are or livestock are, are sort of propelled along a path you know narrowed down and propelled along a path so it motivates us, it propels us, it pushes us forward. It's a motivating power in, in, in Paul's life, the love of Christ. Now, now, for that to be a real motivating power, you really need to believe that you are a recipient of the love of Christ. We have this saying about putting the cart before the horse, and it's like, in, in my mind, I've sort of had the idea that I've got to, I'm motivated in order to, so that Christ loves me. But Paul's sort of saying, I'm motivated because of the love of Christ that, that he felt as a, in a very real way. And what is, what is the most effective motivator? Well, well, fear is a very effective motivator and it works, it works very well. You can ask any dictator or a, or a psychopath that fear, fear works quite well. But is it, does it work on what God is trying to achieve? Yes, there's a, it has an element of... Uh, wisdom to it, doesn't it? Fear and, and, and all those sorts of things. But really the most powerful motivator that transforms us based on free will, based on us choosing God, choosing life, comes not from fear so much. It comes from a response to God's love. Now that response has to be based on, on reality, that we feel God's love, that we know in a sense, we have an assurance of God's love. And if our view of salvation is based on we don't know, we'll never know until the final verdict 
we find out what the hammer falls, and at that point we'll find out. Then I find these motivating concepts hard, hard to work in with that, that paradigm. Here's an interesting quote from Romans 2. We might, we'll be looking at Romans 2 a bit later on, but it's just interesting how Paul says, he says, O despises thou the riches of his goodness and forbearance and long-suffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leads to repentance. Interesting, we think repentance is something, a fear response, because we are fearful, and so we respond to the wrath of God and repent. And he's saying it's the, it's the goodness of God that, that leads, the word lead is, is the idea of to drive or to bring us to repentance. It's a, a motivating force based on the goodness of God, based on the gift of God, based on the salvation of God, based on what God's done for us. And if he's done something for us, we've got to feel that he has and believe that he has and, and know that he has. The idea that God's love, not just a motivating source, but it's, it's the end result as well. God, and this is why fear, fear isn't the ultimate um, motivator. Fear isn't the ultimate um, thing that God is using to change us and develop us and transform us because fear is, is not the main game. Fear might be used at certain times and has its, has, has its place, but it's not, the, it's not the main thing. God, through love and by love, has brought about salvation in order to generate love. And, and, and that's, there's, this, there's this process there. And First John talks about the love of God perfected using this, this Greek word teleos. You know, this, this, this cycle of love is, is generated from God's love to us. We, we give it back to him as we serve him and, and, and show love to others. Brother, Brother Carter wrote, wrote in the article on the atonement, he says, quoting from John 3, 16, God so loved the world. He says, the love of God and of Jesus Christ is not only the motive source for redemption, but it's the basis of a powerful appeal to man to consider the ways of God and to respond to the love shown. God commends his love to us, Paul declares. God's saying, my love's actually what I'm trying to achieve. What, what is the outcome, the process? So love was the motive source and love is the, out, the, out, the output that God's achieving in his, in his purpose. There's a saying, those who work in, uh, in IT know the saying, or the acronym GIGO, garbage in, garbage out. Or, uh, it's basically saying what, what you put into a process is what you, what you generate out of the process. Um, God's love is the input to the process of salvation. It's, it's, it's the motive behind what God has done because it's what God is trying to generate at the other end, if that makes sense. It's, it's what he's trying to achieve from us. So fear, it is used by God, of course, and it plays its part, but it's, it's not the overwhelming motivating force. Love really is. We need to try and work out how we make that real in in the context of the judgment seat paradigm that we, that we might hold. And there's some verses there. Uh, First John 4, in this was manifested the love of God towards us because that he sent his only begotten son into the world that we might live through him and God commends or exhibits or introduces his love towards us that while we were yet sinners, Christ, Christ died for us. And this brings me to another motivating factor that we need to build into our model of the judgment seat as well. So, so God's love has to be taken into account. The assure, there's got to be a sense, I feel, a sense of assurance that we are a recipient of God's love, despite, despite our failures. We know that. We own that. But we still trust, not in ourselves, we trust in God's love. And built into the atonement, in, in a sense, our, our contribution to the atonement when we, when we really get down to it. I, I've, I've summarised by the, the phrase gratitude. If you want to sort of say what, at the end of the day, we, we, we know the blood of Christ and, and, the, and, the, and the explanation of the, you know, God's declared righteousness in his son and, and our identification with it in baptism and in our life, etc. But at the, at the end of the day, the real, the real glue to that, that process that works for us is this idea of gratitude and response to what God's done. It's not, it's not a technical bells and pulleys type thing that, that we just slot into. and it, it's, it's all based on our gratitude for, for God's incredible love. And, and that needs to be the, 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 the motivating factor in our thoughts. And 
When we look at the New Testament, we see this idea of, of gratitude at the underpinning our, our, our life and our motivation. Just love the juxtaposition of Romans 7 and Romans 8. It's, they're, they're quite, both of them, beautiful chapters in their own way, but there's this real change of, of tone, isn't there, as we move from Romans 7 to Romans 8. There's no, there's no chapter break in reality, as we know, but we can, we can feel this change. We've got Romans 7, Paul expressing his own failure in Romans 7, and the things that he doesn't want to do, he fails and falls into, and things that he knows he should do, he doesn't do, and, and you feel this, you, f- you, f- you feel the identification of that in your own life, don't you? That's a very, very powerful chapter. And he uses this word wretched, you know, a wretched man that I am. Who's going to deliver me from this body of death? And he describes himself in Romans 7 as a captive. You know, some commentators have seen in his words, there's a, a bit of a metaphor of a Roman torture method where they used to get a dead body and strap it to you while you were still alive and throw you into a dungeon and the body would rot through and putrefy and, and it was a painful, terrible way to die. But be that as it may, Paul is, he's feeling wretched. He's describing himself as, as in captivity to the law of sin and death. He's in captivity to its effects in a, in a moral sense, not just a physical sense, but his, his failures go back to that and he feels... He feels that, oh, wretched man that I am. And then you go to Romans 8, and, you, and you've got this incredible change of, of tone here. He starts off verse 1, there is no condemnation. We'll look at this a bit later on tonight. No condemnation to them that are in Christ Jesus. No condemnation. But only literally that much, a few verses before, he's wretched. And then you get to the end of Romans 8. In all these things, we are more than conquerors. We're, in the Greek, it's super, we're like super conquerors through him who loved us. And I am persuaded that neither death or life or angels or principalities or powers or anything, any other creature. I mean, what a way to finish an exposition on the atonement. Most commentators would agree Romans 1 to 8 is a, a profound treatise on the atonement. And he finishes Romans 8 with... What you could say, as speaking humanly, is a lot of wasted words. All these, all these, all these, you know, what shall separate us and, and, and nothing can separate us. And, and he lists all these things. That look, it's sort of like, well, it's a, it, from a tightly packed argument that runs all the way through Romans, now, now he's wasting verses after verses. He's not wasting it at all, is he? He's expressing what the atonement means for us as individuals. In all these things, we are more than conquerors and nothing can separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Now, Romans 7 and Romans 8, just think of the juxtaposition here. You've got this, incre- this wretchedness at the end of chapter 7. A wretched man that I am. You've got no condemnation that runs through chapter 8 and this victory um, uh, song at the end, you know, of, of more than conquerors. Where's the fulcrum? Where's, where's, where's the shift happen? And the shift, I believe, happens at the end of chapter 7. He says, I thank God. I thank God. And, and, and that becomes the, the fulcrum or the, the tipping point, if you like, from the wretchedness of captivity, of this wretched situation that all of us can identify with, even the great apostle Paul, to the victory and the conquering uh, position that we are in in Christ, which Romans 8 beautifully outlines. And this thankfulness then, is the power that, that, that takes us from one to the other. And I, 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 it's very true, brother, says you would, you would never have Romans 8 without Romans 7. You, know, you, would, you, you can't just go to the victory without feeling the wretchedness and, the, and, 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 and owning the, our sins, etc. But, but we don't wallow in chapter 7 and stay there either, do we? We read on and we get to Romans 8. So the, the two are, are beautifully positioned. And thankfulness is the, is the key here. One of the other things I want us to think about over the course of this week is is the idea of salvation, what it means to be saved. You know, when Paul preached and the early apostles preached, the message was pretty simple. You know, believe and be baptised and you'll be saved. The Philippian jailer is going, sirs, what must we do to be saved? Believe, be baptised, you'll be saved with your house. It was a pretty simple message 
that generated an incredible and powerful response. The paradigm, I suppose, or the, or the, the perception we have, and I'm speaking for myself, growing up in Sunday school and coming through youth group, etc. The perception I absorbed, and it might just be because I'm not real bright, I don't know, but the, the perception I absorbed was that salvation was something you work towards. And we use terms like when we're baptised, we're, we're starting our walk towards the kingdom and we're on probation. And, 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 the, and the, the idea that I formed was, well, salvation is something that is way off in the future that I need to work towards and eventually I'll get my life to a point where I'm, I'm sort of worthy of that, not that I've earned it, but I've, I've sort of got to get to that spiritual maturity, if you like, where, where I'm, I'm going to be saved or I'm going to be in, that, in the sort of pale of salvation, if that makes sense. And that's a, a subconscious idea that I, I, I felt and I've spoken to other people in my age group that feel the same. So we, we start off at baptism, we go through life with our ups and downs and all our issues and at some point, and, and a bit like Abraham, we, we'll look at this example later on, but you know, James presents Abraham as, as offering Isaac as this ultimate example of, of, of faith, uh, works demonstrating his faith. And, and it sort of reads like if you, if you, on the surface that that point he reached this spiritual maturity where he's finally saved, where he's finally, you know, his works have demonstrated his faith and God says, I can, I can now save you. And, and we sort of feel that we're in our life way back here somewhere, haven't reached that yet. Or another, another perception might be that we start off when we're first converted and baptised and we start off within the pale of salvation, but we come to stages in our life where we, we might stop doing the readings or we might stop praying or, or we might go through a slack spell and, all, and that sort of, in a sense, pops us out of salvation because we're no longer walking after the Spirit, you see, so we're no longer a child of God or a son of God and we, we pop out of salvation. And then something might happen and, and, you know, there's a crisis in the Middle East and we get ourselves back on track and we come back, get ourselves fired up again and we're back in the pale of salvation and, and life goes on and it really depends where the, aim, where the you know, what stage we're at when the angel turns up as to whether, whether we're, we're going to be saved or not. Look, I just want to read to you, I know reading slabs is, is sort of boring, but, I, but I, I do want to use other people's words sometimes because I sort of stumble a little bit when I try and say these clearly. But Brother Harry Tennant commented on this particular view and, and, and he put it so beautifully. I just want to read that for you. I'll, shall I put on an English accent and try and do it like Uncle Harry? No, maybe not. When it says he, he was you know, very ruddy and very worked up when he said this, so I, I won't try and imitate it exactly, but... He says, when it says in Romans 8, there is now therefore no condemnation to them that are in Christ Jesus who walk not after the flesh but after the spirit, it means what it says. The Lord God knows that nobody walks perfectly after the spirit and that some of us, some of the time, are affected by the flesh, but there still is no condemnation. I know that sometimes when we look at that verse, the possibility is that people say, wait just a second, it's not quite as easy as that. That bit at the end that says who walked on after the flesh but after the spirit does mean what it says and you're only out of condemnation when you walk after the spirit and you're not in condemnation when you walk after the flesh. In which case you're constantly red and green. You're changing colour all the time, moving from one place to another. Now Romans 8 doesn't say that. It says, who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? So there isn't a charge against us. No charge against us at all. God doesn't work that way. He doesn't work on a debit and credit method at all. He's working on those who are in Christ and since Christ is not condemned, the saints are not condemned and we don't have to go through life with this terrifying fear. These are some studies on, on Hebrews. I find that he puts that quite nicely. We're not changing colour, red and green. One minute where we come home because we've had a bad day at work and kick the dog and, you know, whatever. And boom, we're out of salvation. Next minute we... We do the readings and bang, we're back in and out. And he's, that, that's, not, that's not how it works. It's how humans work. It's how we think, but it's not how the atonement works. It's not how the grace of God works. And, and hopefully we'll, we'll make some more comments on that. And, you know, as I said tonight, I'm not proving anything. I'm just laying out issues and considerations. And we'll, we'll focus on these a bit more as we go through. So this is the model that... I believe more closely reflects reality 
The pale of salvation is there all the time while we are sons of God. And at conversion, at baptism, the default setting is salvation. That is the default. We, we are in Christ. And all those blessings in Ephesians, they, they mean what they mean. You know, they're, they're true. We are adopted. We are, we are sons of God. Okay, so all those, all those things are true. Within that, within that experience, within that family relationship, because that's really what it is, that, the metaphor of a, of, of a family is really, really powerful here. Within that, we do experience highs and lows, and we do work towards spiritual maturity. That's really our aim, and that's what, you know, when God's working in us, that, that is the objective, this spiritual maturity which is you know, love, really, at the end of the day. And there are lows and times where we fail and times where we get things wrong and times where we make big mistakes, some of us. All of us, really, but some of us more obvious than others. And, and these are times that we experience the, the chastisement of the Lord, as, as Hebrews 12 talks about. It is, still within, it is still within the family relationship. It's still within the context of salvation. We haven't popped out of salvation when we have failed. We are still within the pale of salvation. That's, that's where we want, to, we want to go. There's this, you know, talking about God's love, um, you know, the, the Old Testament word, often translated you know, loving kindness or kindness, is a really, really special word. And so God's love is not some some random type of love, some, some sort of just, just love as we understand it or just kindness as we understand it. It's, it's a relationship word. It's the word hesed, or we pronounce it chesed, the chesed of Yahweh. And here's, here's one um, commentator, Hebrew commentator talking about this word. It says, the word chesed is, is used only in cases where there is some recognised tie between the parties concerned. It's not used indiscriminately of kindness in general, haphazard, kindly deeds. And this is why Coverdale's translation was careful to avoid the word kindness in respect of God's dealings with his people Israel. The theological importance of the word chesed is that it stands more than any other word for the attitude which both parties to a covenant ought to maintain towards each other. Here we're getting to the, to the, nut, to the crux of the, of the matter. The love God has for us is not just love in, the, in, in, sort, of that, in sort of a sort of uh, open-ended sense. God's love is a covenant love. It's a relationship love. There is a, there is a, it is akin to the love we have for our children, in a sense. It's a, it's a love that has obligations attached to it and, and, and commitments. And it's a, it's a very special word. And we, we know it's a word that defines God himself. He's the very famous um, declaration of God's glory here in Exodus 34. Yahweh passed by before him, proclaimed, Yahweh, Yahweh, Ayo, merciful and gracious, long-suffering, abundant. And these two words basically summarise God for us in his character. The goodness, abundant goodness and truth. Goodness is this word, chesed or hesed. This, this covenant love that God has for his people. Um, keeping chesed for thousands, forgiving iniquity. You see the out... The outworking of chesed, forgiving iniquity, you know, mercy, all, all these sort of all these sort of characteristics, and, and linked there with the truth of God, the emeth, truth and the goodness and mercy of God. It's a it's a covenant thing. It's not something that you earn necessarily. It's something because you are in a relationship with God that that this love applies. And you know, the covenant nature of this. Um, sorry, I'm just about to finish. The covenant nature of this word is, is, is picked up in places like Psalm 47 where um, Jacob, called Israel here, makes Joseph swear that he will um, bury him not in Egypt. And he says, he says, put your hand on my thigh and deal kindly or chesed and truly. That's goodness and truth. That's the same word, goodness and truth. It's a, it's a covenant phrase in a sense. It's talking about a relationship or a covenant or an agreement. And God delights in chesed. You know, it's, 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 what, it's what God is, essentially what he is. You know, God is abundant in this. And, and that's what he delights in. That's, that's, that's him. And the connection with transgressions being forgiven and sins being covered is, is, 
runs all the way through Scripture. But, you know, in Psalm 32, it's seen so clearly there. Blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Many sorrows shall be to the wicked, but he that trusts in Yahweh, Chesed shall compass him about. That's a very interesting concept. Chesed will compass him. Like we had those diagrams of, of the pale of salvation, if you like, or, or being within God's love, being within God's mercy, being a recipient of God's grace. If you're in covenant relationship with God, you are, you are compassed in, in that sense. You're, you're encircled by the chesed of Yahweh, which is, which is quite amazing. And that brings us to a word we will finish soon. Sorry, I know I'm getting over time here, so I apologise. But this is a word that will feature a lot in our considerations, this idea of in. It's, it's, it's the key word in Ephesians, isn't it? You know, we're in Christ. The blessings we have, the, the love we receive, all, all the things that are the riches of God's blessings to us come because of the fact we are in. And so it becomes this defining word. We are in him. In 1 John 2, we, we'll look at it later on, but you know, it's abide in him that we may not that we might have confidence that he's at the judgment seat. So we are in him. And Romans 8 talks about those that are in Christ are the re recipients of God's love. Those who went into the ark, those who were stayed in the house at Passover. Colossians 1, we are transferred into the kingdom of God at baptism. There's a, there's a change of status that, that happens to us. And we are, we are now inside the chessed circle. We're inside the, 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 the border of God's love in that sense. And then the opposite word is those who go out. They went out from us. As the tonight's reading said in First John, they went out from us because they were not of us. And, and they demonstrated that by going out. And they departed. They removed. And we can do that. We can depart and move and put ourselves outside of God's, God's covenant love. And we'll talk a bit more about that. So our journey in life is not to get to this level where we're going to be saved nor do we pop in and out of salvation as we go. We are always in that, that chesed of Yahweh. We're always in the circle of God's love. And all the blessings associated with that are ours while we are in God's love. Even though, of course, we fail and we receive the, the negative implications of our, of our actions. Now this, of course, I, I, have, to, I have to make this very clear. Um, you know, the evangelical churches teach this once saved, always saved um, theology, which we don't believe. We can put ourselves outside of God's love. We can make shipwreck of our faith. Or we can you know, go out from, you know, like Judas went out into the darkness you know, and, and, and rejected the Lord. We can do that, absolutely. And we're not um, in any way minimising the reality of, of that. So instead of this idea of you know, sometimes, sometimes, you know, the way God manifestations presented as I grew up as a kid was this idea that, um, again, this is my perception, so you may not have had the perception, but, like, I, I sort of assumed and thought that as, as life went on and I learned more about God's word and I got more mature, that I would sort of become a better and better and more faithful person and somehow get more closer and like, more like God. It, it sort of works that way, but not, not that way at all. The, this is, this is more the reality. And I'm using Abraham as an example. Abraham left Ur, arrives in Shechem, an act of faith. He crossed over. He became, his Hebrew obeyed God, not knowing whither he went. Great act of faith. You could say it's an up on the graph of faith. Then in the very next chapter, he heads off into Egypt as a, as a, 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 a sign of a lack of faith. And he receives a chastisement of, of Yahweh when he's in Egypt and the, and the negative things that he experiences there. Then they've got the story where he rescues Lot and shows faith in that. Then the whole incident of Hagar, the renewal of the promises, the story of Gera, where he repeats the same problem, that the same faithlessness that he demonstrated in chapter 13 with, uh, with Sarai, etc. And the sacrifice of Isaac being a pinnacle in that story. I present it like that to show you that it wasn't, it wasn't here at the end of the process where Abraham finally got into the salvation slot. He, the moment he, he obeyed the call and he left, he left Ur, he was in the chesed of Yahweh. Yes, he did silly things in that, it, during that process. You know, the, the lessons he learned here, when he's there laying on Pharaoh's 
marble floor with his teeth chattering and his bowels probably felt like giving way and he's terrified for his life as Pharaoh tells him to get out of his country. That, that chastisement of the law, that, that failure of faith at that time was, part of, was, was what contributed eventually to a man who could take a knife and, and, and at, in faith knowing that his son would be resurrected and could obey God to that, to that, that level. All these things, you know, the failures form part of, of, the, of the development. So in a sense, yes, there is a spiritual development in God manifestation. Whether we represent it like that is, is questionable. It's, it's more like this, isn't it? We have, we have ups and downs, failures. We learn from them. But if we stay, if we abide in him, if we stay in the confines of the, the, the chess set of Yahweh, we are still in God's family. We are still a recipient of God's love and God's grace. And the New Testament it's not, it picks up these ideas as well. We haven't got time to dwell on them now, but you know, all the metaphors of the atonement, we're covered, we're washed, we stand in grace, Romans 5 verse 2, we're in this grace and we stand. The concepts of sins being put far from us, Psalm 103, Leviticus 16 on the day of atonement with a scapegoat, all, all those symbols and concepts and metaphors, they all represent reality and truth. We've got to believe that. We are, we are the recipients of God's love. Our sins are put far from us. We are in the house of God. We are in the ark and these things are, are true and real despite our failings and, and they will play a part in it. So brothers and sisters, that's our first session. As I said, I haven't proven anything. I haven't uh, really even got into the judgment seat so much at all. I've just sort of hopefully set up some issues that we want to explore and as we explore them, see how the judgment seat then fits in with all those issues and, and, uh, and, and can they all be gelled together in, in, in a comprehensive way. Thanks, Bob.